Thank you so much, Hawa, for the very generous and kind introduction. Good evening, beautiful black people. <laughs> Good evening, beautiful non-black people. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I'm very honored, very touched to be, uh, to be with you. It's a special day. Happy Black History Month to all of us. Uh, there's so much that we have overcome, so much that we have achieved. Uh, despite incredible circumstances, but here we are. And we're here to celebrate ourselves, celebrate each other, and also celebrate what we will be, what we will become, and the world that we will create. Um, so I am, uh, as Hawa very well explained, the Secretary General of Amnesty International. For those of you who may not be familiar with Amnesty International, we are a movement, a global international movement, of over 10 million people, you know, people like you and I, um, ordinary folks who care about human rights and who mobilize across 150 countries around the world to make sure that our basic human rights are respected. And when I say basic human rights, uh, I mean the rights that are articulated in the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you may remember that a little bit from way back in school, or maybe not. I would encourage you to read us that document because it is so key. It articulates that each one of us, because we are human beings, everyone and no one is excluded from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's one of the, those rights is the right to health. Not the right to any health, the right to the highest standards of health. And that includes mental health. And so for anyone who may be wondering, what is Amnesty doing talking about mental health? This is why. Because mental health is a fundamental human right. And we know that when we are not living free from poverty, free from homelessness, free from discrimination, free from racism, free from torture, when we are not free to express ourselves, our mental health suffers. And likewise, when our mental health is not well, we are not able to fully express ourselves and to fully impact our communities as we would want to. So it is a critical path. And we know that mental health is a particular challenge within the black community. We have borne the brunt of so much over centuries. Those of us like, like, like myself who have found ourselves here on these lands come with so much baggage. And we still face a lot in our day-to-day -day lives. And yet I know as an African woman, the stigma that comes with being able to access mental health. Uh, I grew up being told that, you know, things are dealt with in a family. You don't talk to strangers about your issues. That family is remedy. And when you arrive on these lands, you're often, because of the trauma of surveillance, you're worried that if you go see a mental health practitioner, this will somehow show up in your employment files, this will follow you through your career and your life. And so there is so much that stops us from getting the help that we often need, and that we need to be better human beings and to fully enjoy our rights. So this is why we focused on this topic today. We have a panel of fabulous black women, all fabulous experts, who will talk to us about this in depth. But um, I urge you to really listen, but also talk about this as well within your community. And uh, I also urge you to find out more about the work that we do at Amnesty overall. I cannot help but note that this is also the day that Tyree Nichols was um, laid to rest in Memphis. And that this is again another, I, I, I lose the words, right? Um, this is another trauma on all of us. And so all of us tonight need mental health. All of us need that support. Um, and I, but at the same time, I look at all of us around here and I'm struck by this balance between tragedy and beauty. And this is what we have been about. Our resilience, we've managed to transcend so much, so many tragedies and to build beauty out of, out of the rubbles. And so this is what this evening is about. It's about us transcending together so that we can be stronger and we can be a stronger world and community together. So thank you again, welcome very much, and enjoy your evening. <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Chrissy Doyle Thomas is uh, uh, based in Toronto. She's an expert in medical conditions that affect the brain and mental health. Dr. Chrissy's research has been published in numerous high impact peer reviewed journals and presented around the world. Dr. Chrissy's passionate about helping people maximize their potential as it relates to understanding how the brain works and she's committed to translating scientific research into meaningful information that can help communities live healthy, mindful lives. And we were just talking about the importance of that knowledge translation and, and creating change uh, in the world based on some of these findings. Um, so I'll pass it off to her. She'll be speaking with us about the correlation between the brain and mental health, um, how our mind and our brain are really one and the same the chemicals in our brain that affect our mental health, including serotonin and oxytocin, um, and also what we can do to improve these levels uh, to build our mental capacity, and also touching on the main modules of our brain and how they function and how this all relates to our thinking. So I have the pleasure of passing it off to Dr. Chrissy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a great welcome. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to Joan and the organizers. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. It is such a privilege to be sharing this space with all of you this evening. I, I know that this conversation this evening is gonna be fantastic and hopefully take us beyond this room into being true change makers in, the, um, in our community for mental health. So as we shared, I am a medical neuroscientist and I think this evening, I want to talk about three things in particular with you. And I hope that this information leads you and it helps you to apply it to your everyday life and your understanding of mental health and also in your support of others, okay? So the three points I want to make this evening, one is that the mind is the product of brain activity. The mind and the brain is one in the same thing. When we think of our mind, it is intimately connected to the structure and the function of our brain, okay? So that's the first thing that I hope to leave you here believing at the end of my talk. The second thing I want to, what, want to talk about is that life experiences can cause physical changes in our brain structure and function. Think about that. The things we experience in our lives, the things that we see on the news, right? We were just talking about that. That can physically change our brain. So I'm gonna explain some of that to you this evening. And then lastly, I wanna talk about life choices and how the things we can do can actually be protective to our brain health. Does that sound interesting? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I feel like I have your attention, that's fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about what mental health is first, okay? We all have mental health, every single one of us, we have mental health. In the same way, we have physical health, right? And physical health is the health of the body. So when we talk about the neck down, that's physical health. Everything neck up, that's mental health. It just has to do with the health of our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, right? Mental health, the mind, sorry, the mind is heavily influenced by what happens in the brain. It, it's influenced by what structurally is going on and how these brain areas connect and work functionally together. That's mental health, okay? People exist up and down the spectrum of mental health. Mental health rests on a spectrum. From one end, you might be thriving and enjoying life and, fu and functioning very, very well. Next, you might be coping. Things aren't perfect, but they're not too bad, so you're coping with life. Or you might be struggling a bit. All of these things are natural variations of mental health. Afterwards, there might be a period of time where your mental health is tried so much that you dip into being unwell. That's where mental illness comes about. But this is a spectrum. We find ourselves all through this spectrum from times in our lives, from one time to another. When we talk about mental illness, that's only one part of the spectrum. Stats Canada shared that one in every five Canadians are experiencing a mental health condition, illness at any one time, okay? So it's, it's more common than we think it is. And if you're not experiencing a mental illness, the rest of you are, are, are on a spectrum, whether you're thriving, 
coping or struggling. But we're all, we all have mental health and a responsibility to maintain that. We experience mental health. When we experience mental health and mental illness, we might think of it as abstract, but it actually isn't. It's rooted in very chemical activities that are happening within our brain. It's all very physical. We might not be able to see our brain or understand what we might be experiencing, but the chemicals in our brain is behind what we experience as a behavior, as a thought, as a feeling, okay? We have approximately 86 billion, with a B, <laughs> neurons in our brain, brain cells. And all of these cells communicate chemically, right? So just imagine the host of, of ability that rests within our brain and all of this is happening within a brain chemistry, chemicals that are triggering behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. Now, some chemicals that you might be aware of, who knows about adrenaline? We all know what adrenaline does, right? Adrenaline is there when our fight and flight is there, when we need to go, 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 when there is a need to get something done and quickly because potentially there's a threat. We have to protect ourselves. So that behavior, that thought, that feeling is mediated by a chemical called adrenaline. We might all feel love at some period of time when you hug your loved one. Oh, if you have a child, you know, or if you have someone who you play sports with and you pat them on the, on the bum or you give them a high five, that feel good feeling of support and connectedness is related to another chemical called oxytocin. It's also there when we, are have, when we have romantic partners, right? So these are chemicals that mediate behaviors. Another chemical that you might be aware of is endorphins. Who goes to the gym and works out and feels so good after, right? That's endorphins. Those are the chemicals that are helping your body get into a different state. So those are examples of how chemicals in our brain impact how we feel, how we think, and how we behave. Now, these chemicals are strongly influenced by what happens in our environment, okay? Think about it, we have five senses. So constantly, we are getting fed information to the brain. The brain is processing it and, de and deciding, well, what am I gonna do about this, right? And making a response. This is how we interact with the world. When I talk about environments, I don't only talk about the things that our five senses can tell us, but also our life experiences, right? That's part of our environment. Things like our family dynamic, our work situation, our relationships, the news we consume on the TV. Mm -hmm. These are all things that influence the chemical reactions and the chemical exchanges in our brain. In happy times, we might feel love. That's the action of oxytocin. We might feel rewarded when we check something off our to-do list. We all have to-do lists. I tend to put things on my to-do list so I can check it off just to feel oh, good. After good. That. Right. That's that is the action of dopamine because I know what it would do for me. It will spur me to do more of that thing, right? I might also, or you might also feel satisfaction and just a sense of, of calmness and okayness. That's serotonin. That's one of our mood boosting chemicals. We might feel that natural pain relief after we work out in the gym and the endorphins are flowing. All these happy chemicals help keep our brain our mental health in the good part of the spectrum. But from time to time, we might experience a threat and that can trigger our stress response, okay? And we're gonna talk about the impact of cortisol on the brain. Now, are we familiar with cortisol? This is our stress hormone, at least one of them. And what stress is there with adrenaline, they couple together to help us when we are in a situation that is, is a threat right, when there's a stress response. And the main function of this stress response is to keep us safe. That's the main function. Now, for the purpose of this event, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about racialized trauma and how that impacts our brain. And a lot of that has to do with unmanaged stress. When, mm -hmm. when our body and our brain is in that stress response too long, it starts to change our brain in very unproductive ways, mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna talk about that a bit more. Now, in the acute stage of that stress response, it's okay, right? Because it helps to keep us safe. 
think about um, what it does when it's keeping us safe is it turns off our need to relax, it heightens our, our, our arousal, and it stops like, you know, the cognitive processing about your life goals and your great thoughts and reflections, no time for that. You're, you are in survival mode. You are narrowed in on that fight and flight response. That is the intention of the stress response, to take off the part of the brain that allows us to relax and think and be reflective and turn on the part of the brain that has us ready to fight or run. It's advantageous when it's in the acute stage. It keeps us alive. The problem happens when it's prolonged and we don't manage it well, or we're unable to bring that back to a resting state. And that is what happens when we experience constant um, you know, imagery and evidence of racial encounters. It puts our body in a fight and flight or survival mode for longer than it needs to be. Prolonged cortisol in our brain is what becomes not advantageous, right? It's what becomes a problem. In fact, cortisol is actually categorized as a neurotoxin. It's a chemical, but it's a toxin. That means that it will do damage to the brain if it's there for too long. And this is why, you know, all these kind of mental wellness efforts and mental health efforts, it's like, manage your stress. You got to manage your stress. You're going to have a whole bunch of problems if you don't. It's because it's a toxin and it actually impacts our brain negatively. Here are some things that it does. It actually reduces the size. It actually cuts away at brain structures such as the hippocampus. That's one of our brain structures that are in, responsible for learning and memory. And you can think to yourself, we're adults, we don't learn, we're not in school, but think about all the things you do in work every day. All those new tasks that you are tasked with, the new recipe that you might be trying, the new routine at the gym, right? Think about the new things that you're reading in the newspaper. Those are all learning. That is a sign of learning. And what cortisol does is impacts our ability to do this. It also impacts our memory and our ability to call that learning when we need to. What it also does, it affects our prefrontal lobe, the front of our brain that is highly um, unique to humans. We have it beyond, it's further developed than any other animal on the face of this earth. And where, what our frontal lobe does, it helps us with things that are unique to human, like problem solving, like inhibiting uh, behaviors, like figuring out you know, what we want to do, our life goals and dreams, and these highly cognitive things, that's what our prefrontal cortex does. But when we have lengthy cortisol exposure in our brain, cortisol starts to cut off the connection between the part of our brain that processes fear and the part of our brain, our prefrontal lobe, that makes sense of that fear and develop proactive, reactive, but strategic steps forward to help our wellness. Cortisol starts cutting away at that connection. That's why we're overpowered with fear and we're unable to tamper it because that connection is getting degraded by the lengthy presence of cortisol in our brain. So these things that we experience, it seems abstract, but there are very physical properties that are happening in our brain that is, you know, the, the uh, foundation of our worry and our fear and our uneasiness when we are in a stressful state for long periods of time. And this happens when we are exposed to this racialized um, trauma that we are unfortunately living through right now. It can also lead to things like depression, which affects the brain and chemicals the serotonin, which is our mood stabilizing um, chemical, and norepinephrine, which is the chemical that gets us the, all the energy we need in our body to act quickly, right? So when we are depressed, those two chemicals are impacted. And what happens? It affects our mood. It affects our ability to think. It affects our behavior. It leaves us feeling sad and fatigued and decreased motivation because these chemicals aren't doing what they're supposed to. They're impacted by the presence of this imbalance in its chemistry, and it impacts our behavior as a consequence. 
Racialized trauma can also lead to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And how this becomes a problem is that PTSD alters the way that we process traumatic memories. It leaves those memories in our brain with an associated heightened arousal state, that fight, flight, and freeze. So the quickest thing we see puts us back in that anxious state, right? It triggers our excessive fear or anxiety or negative emotion because the memory is laid in that heightened arousal state. And this becomes problematic because remember what I said, when we are in that fight, flight, survival mode, we're not thinking about our goals and our grocery list and what we need to do at work. We're trying to survive. So if racialized trauma puts us in that, you know, has us experienced things like PTSD, it's changing the way our brain is able to function on the everyday because we're in survival mode. And that cognitive part is turned off or down or being ineffective in what it's supposed to do. So we have to pay attention to how our brain changes, how the chemi chemistry changes when we are exposed to racial in, um, encounters that leave us in a traumatic state. We have to be very careful. Very physical, uh, chemical changes are happening in our brain. Now, this is our, uh, our brain's innate response to life stressors, including uh, racialized trauma, as well as other stressors like changes in our relationships, changes in our work status, you know, illness, you know, false, well, not false, but we have ex unmet expectations. Those are all things, life experiences, life stressors that can put our brain in, an un, in a chemical imbalanced state as well, right? Again, the acute stage of this is advantageous. It alerts us to act quickly to make us safe. But the prolonged, the chronic state of this is problematic because it starts to change our brain in very physical and structural ways. So what can we do about this? And this brings me to my last point. I hope I'm within 20 minutes. <laughs> this brings me to my last point. What can we do? And it's a multi-level, so I'm not going anywhere too soon, but this is what it is. <laughs> it brings us to our lifestyle choices. Now, when I talk about lifestyle, this doesn't fix mental illness. It helps keep us within a mentally healthy space. Mental illness is something else, and my colleagues here are going to talk more about that. I'm going to touch on it very briefly. But I will tell you some things that we can do within our life that we know that science has shown is able to impact the chemistry of your brain quite effectively. Things that you all know work, but maybe we took it for granted, right? One thing is watching your thought life. Being careful what you choose to consume, what information you choose to consume, what you are exposed to, okay? If a trigger isn't there, your brain is not going to activate that stress response. So if you don't have to look at that video, don't look at it, okay? You don't want to trigger that stress response in you. The more your body triggers that stress response is the more the brain is going to learn that it is a preferred state that you want to be in and it would leave you there longer. longer. And it's going to become into a mental illness where you'll then have to see Roxanne, right? <laughs> so help yourself by monitoring what you expose yourself to. The next thing you can do related to your thoughts is take time to reflect. Take time to make sense of what you're feeling. When we are in survival mode, we're not out occupying or we're not using our prefrontal decision-making, highly unique um, human abilities to make sense of things. You have to be purposeful to bring that online, to say, no, I need to make sense of this emotion and what I'm gonna do the next time I'm triggered or the next time I'm in a, in a similar situation. Make sense so you can plan your course of action so that when you're triggered the next time or when something happens that puts you into that space, you are prepared with a more productive reaction, okay? The next thing that you can do is practice gratitude. Everybody says be grateful, and this is not toxic positively. For, and, and for anybody, I am not a believer in, in toxic positivity, which is that everything will be fine. You know, look at the bright side. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's important to have a balanced perspective. Life is crappy sometimes. 
there are also things that we can be grateful for. And what happens when we exercise gratitude, it changes our brain chemistry. It turns on dopamine, which is our reward brain chemical. It turns on serotonin, which is our mood stabilizing brain chemical. It actually has a chemical impact. And then practice mindfulness. You know, Nicole was talking to us earlier before we started. She said, if we need to take a break to breathe deeply, that would be advantageous. Because what that does is that our survival mode cannot happen at the same time we are resting and breathing and insightful as to what's happening within us in the moment. So when you breathe, that survival mode must downregulate so that other, that opposing system within our, within our body can upregulate itself. So breathing, practicing mindfulness is very advantageous when we talk about things within our control. Something else I want to leave with you, watch what you eat. The reason why I say that is because our brain chemicals have to be synthesized from something. And what it's synthesized from is the components of the food we eat, right? We have nutritionists in the room here, right? Trudy, and she can, she can attest to this, right? We break down the foods that we eat and it creates the building blocks for us to synthesize those happy brain chemicals. So things like fatty acids that are high in fatty acids, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, all the nice fishes that we like, the fatty fishes that we like, like salmon and trout and, you know, all sardines and stuff. Coffee is really good. Blueberries, right? Turmeric, broccoli, pumpkin seed. I have a list I can give you after. <laughs> what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that these things are advantageous. They give us the chemicals we need to, to uh, supply to our brain what it needs to build and synthesize those happy brain chemicals. Exercise. I don't like to exercise, but I do force myself to walk every now and then because I know it's good for my brain. What exercising does, it releases dopamine, our, our, our rewarding brain chemical, endorphins, we talked about that, our natural pain reliever. It also has this secret sauce that it actually triggers chemical activities in our brain that spurs growth factors for the growth of new brain cells. Now, who doesn't want new brain cells, right? <laughs> and exercise does that for us, even within our more mature years. This is not only for kids. We have the capability to change our brain well into our mature years. Another thing I want to leave you with, get good sleep. Now, why sleep is important, we're, we are not about the hustle culture here, okay? <laughs> we need to sleep, and the reason why we need to sleep is because our brain is remarkably active while we're sleeping. Mm. We might not be aware of it, but sleep play, plays a housekeeping role in our brain to move away the toxins, like cortisol. So if we don't get enough sleep, think about how you feel the next day. You're edgy, you're irritated, you're like easily aggravated. That is because those toxins are still there. Sleep helps to remove those toxins, and it's very important that we do that. It also helps us to maintain those pathways of learning and memory that we have gained during the day. Another thing, get outside as much as you can. The sun has very powerful impacts on the chemical changes in your body. It boosts your mood with serotonin, which is a chemical. It enhances your sleep with the production of melatonin. It produces vitamin D, right, which reduces inflammation, um, inflammation, sorry, and strengthens your bones and muscles and does a host of other things. Get outside as much as you can. Get that vitamin D. Community is also very important. When we connect with others, it triggers oxytocin, our love brain chemical that puts us in a state of wellness. Research shows that if we are connected to someone, we have a better chance of dealing with stress than if we're not connected. Mm -hmm. So community is important, even for the introverts like me. Find one person to talk to, that's enough <laughs> for community, right? And you know what? If you're doing all these things and you feel balanced, you feel whole, you feel in control, that's great. That means that you're doing it well, you're doing it the right way. It's not that there's no, there are no stresses in your life. You will have stressors, but you're able to handle it because you're helping your brain produce these chemicals that would help you do stuff. But they do come a time in our life, potentially, where these lifestyle changes mightn't be enough, okay? I'm almost done, sorry. 
these lifestyle changes might not be enough. And that is when we need to look at things like medication, which is a chemical that is made to artificially look like the chemicals in your brain that aren't working as they should. And when those chemicals, when you take that medication, it helps the brain to do what it should in the absence of its own production, okay? Or you go to therapy. And the impact of therapy, which is very powerful, remember I tell you that cortisol cuts off that connection between our fear processing and our ability to make sense of it all. What therapy does is helps us to build that connection again, make meaning of how I feel, this stress, this, this fear, and develop proactive plans and strategies to deal with it in the future. Research shows that after six months of, of therapy, your connections between your fair, fair processing area and your prefrontal lobe is significantly strengthened. So therapy is very therapeutic, okay? <laughs> and it's more than just talking to a friend. When we talk about therapy, they are trained to, to, to strategically help you address negative thinking, enhance resilience, and boost those coping mechanisms. So therapy is important. So I leave you with three points. One, your brain is intimately connected to your mind. Your mind is the product of brain activity. Your life um, experiences can physically change your brain. So be very careful about what experiences you decide to engage with. And lastly, your life choices like diet, exercise, sleep, getting out in nature, watching your thought life, creating community can all help keep you in that protective state where your behavior is, uh, is mentally well. But if you need to, it is okay to reach out for more support. Thank you. Amazing. pleasure of welcoming Roxanne Francis. Uh, so Roxanne is an award-winning registered social worker and psychotherapist. She's the CEO of Francis Psychotherapy and Consulting Services where she runs a very busy group therapy practice. Um, Roxanne is a keynote speaker, a leadership coach, and a corporate consultant who addresses issues related to women's issues, race, equity, mental health, parenting, as well as wellness at work. Roxanne supports and mentors other therapists in the field and is a go-to to the media on mental health uh, expertise and provides answers to many of life's questions. Um, so Roxanne will speak to us about the reason that therapy can help us with our mental health capacity. She'll also speak to how to recognize the signs of mental health issues, um, both in adults and children, and dispel some of the myths related to, to therapy. She'll provide practical solutions on improving our mental health and wellness, and also guidelines in picking a therapist, which I, is incredibly intimidating, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, she'll also address some of the stigma she sees from clients. So I'll pass it off to you, Roxanne. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It's so good to be here tonight, and I just wanna say, Percy, you need to email me that talk so I can just share it with all of you. <laughs> Yes, mm -hmm. nodding, amen, mm -hmm. because everything that she says is something that I say to my clients so often. And it sounds like information that you would get from your grandmother. Take your vitamins, eat your fruits and vegetables, get some sleep, drink your water, go for a walk, right? But these are real lifestyle choices that do impact and improve your mental wellness. So let's talk a little bit about how therapy helps. I mean, Chrissy, Dr. Chrissy already started off with some of those things, but one of the things that she talked about was community. I heard some, someone say a long time ago that a problem shared is a problem halved, right? It's cut in half, right? When you are carrying this thing, when you share it with someone, it reduces the load. But not just sharing it with my good friend over here, because my friend has skin in the game. So if I tell my friend that I'm struggling with my mental health, she might say, oh, it's okay, sis, you'll be fine, just get some sleep, right? Or if I share it with my mom, my mom would say, you don't have anything to worry about, right? If it was back in my day, you would know a thing or two. And so there isn't that objectivity. There isn't that non-judgmental place 
right? And when you go and see a therapist, it is that non-judgmental place. It is that objectivity. And we offer a different perspective. A therapist with good experience will talk to you and challenge you around some of your thought processes, around uh, some of the, the, the difficulties that you're having in your life, you know, whether it's rela relationship issues with your partner or your parent or your children or the stress at work or the racial trauma that you're experiencing, we will sit with it, acknowledge it, validate what it is that you're going through rather than brushing it off, telling you that you have nothing to worry about, right? And we will also sort of spin it a little bit or flip it on its head and have you look at it in a different way and challenge you a little bit, you know, a good relationship with your therapist is almost like, almost like having a really good confidant. But your confidant is less likely to challenge some of those thought processes and might not push you as, um, as much as a therapist would, right? The other thing that the therapist does is, as Christy said, we are trained to help you navigate issues like anxiety and depression, the challenges with uh, motivation, right? In some individuals, their depression is so intense that they have a hard time getting out of bed, right? And if you are, um, many of us in the black community, sometimes we are from uh, cultures and systems and, and uh, families where we don't acknowledge the, the, the depths of things like depression. You know, I heard um, uh, uh, an entertainer the other day on social media say, you know, in the black community, depression is a luxury, right? They say everybody's nodding, right? Depression is a luxury. We can't afford to be depressed. We, ha we gotta get up and get going. We have to, a lot of people go to work and they're not well. That's a phenomenon that I like to call presenteeism, right? You know, absenteeism is when you don't go to work when you're unwell. Uh, presenteeism is when you show up at work and you're unwell. Right? And many of us have to do that. And that is a throwback from enslavement and colonialism where we, our, our only purpose was to produce. Our only purpose was to work. Regardless of whether or not you were well, you had to get up or there were physical, sometimes fatal consequences. And that has uh, persisted over the generations. And many of our parents and our grandparents still carry some of that and will say to us, what are you doing in bed? Get up right? What are you doing taking a day off? You're not sick, right? Get up and get in the shower, comb your hair, go to work, they're going to fire you. Not recognizing that some of these issues are so deep and so pervasive that self-care, something that seems like the simplest act of self-care becomes a challenge, right? And so your therapist will help you hold that, will help you make sense of that, will drill down to the core of those things Right? Uh, sometimes we have individuals who will come in with relation, relational challenges who will say, you know, um, every time I'm in a relationship, this thing happens, what's wrong with me? Right? The therapist will drill down and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with you. Tell me about how you grew up. It's my favorite question. People hate it. Right? Why do you want to know about my family? I'm talking to you about last week. Yes, I know, but you're talking to me about last week and the week before and the month before and the year before. There's, there's something there, right? And we drill down to the history. We drill down to what happened when you were a little child. We drill down to what happened when you were a teenager, when your parent had to go away to the other country to work and left you with someone that you didn't love or someone who you felt didn't love you. And those things persist and are the root of our behaviors. Childhood experiences really lay the foundation of who we are as adults and they impact our choices, they impact how we parent, they impact how we engage in relationships and how we work and persist today, right? I feel like I'm going off topic. I'm just gonna check my notes here. <laughs> so, um, practical solutions to um, improve our mental wellness. So we talked about some of the physical things that we can do, right? Um, of course, seeing a therapist is a good idea. Let's say you are struggling, um, People often say to me, how do I know if what I'm having is regular anxiety? And how do I know if it's an anxiety disorder? How do I know if these past few days of sadness is because I didn't get that raise? Or is it really, truly depression? 
And I will say, take a look at how it's impacting your day-to-day -day functioning. If you are struggling to function, and I mean get up, have breakfast, pour your kid a bowl of cereal, get to work on time consistently, uh, take your break, maybe work the overtime if you need to, hang out with a friend or two on the weekend. If your life is continually uh, challenged, then you need some support. You really need to take a look at that. You know, I've had someone say, well, I was depressed on Saturday, but now I'm better. I'm sorry, my friend, that was sadness, not depression, <laughs> right? And Dr. Christie said that there is a continuum, right? And she's right. There is, I'm thriving, I'm doing okay, I'm coping, I'm struggling, and I am in distress, yeah. right? And if you are struggling to function, chances are there is some kind of distress and you need some support. Now, how do you know about how to pick a therapist? Should I even go to therapy? It's such a taboo topic. You know, keep it in the family, as it was said earlier, right? Uh, family is the remedy. Sometimes family is the stress, right? I'm, I mean, I'm just being real here. <laughs> Sometimes family is the cause of the trauma, right? And when you uh, see a therapist, we will talk about healthy boundaries, which can be like a really bad word in some of our families, right? As children, we were not taught to have boundaries. As children, we were taught to speak when you're spoken to, uh, always say yes, saying no was disrespectful. Um, you know, now when my children say no, my mom raises an eyebrow at me, like, you're gonna raise a child to say no, <laughs> right? Well, he needs, the children need to understand that they can say yes or no around certain things, right? You know, wearing your coat outside when it's minus 30, I won't take a no on that. But, you know, do you want to wear the blue tube today? No, I'll take a no on that if you, if, you wear, if you wear the red one, right? They need to have choices and they need to be able to say no and feel confident in their no. So that when they become adults, right, when they become adults, saying no is okay. They know how to set some of those boundaries, right? I went off topic again. Okay, how to... <laughs> How to pick a good therapist, how to pick a, a therapist that's right for you. I would say um, there's a website that's out there. It's, a lot of people go to Google, but a really great website is called psychologytoday.com. And it's a website that uh, most therapists that I'm aware of have an account on psychology today or psychologists, right? It tells you what they specialize in. It tells you, you know, who they work with, who they might not work with if I only work with adults, if I only work with children, if I do CBT, if I do something else called EMDR, these, they just, they really share their, uh, their profile, if you will, right? The next thing I would encourage you to do is email said therapist. Sometimes they have a really nice picture or they have a nice cute little video, right? Take a look at their profile, take a look at their photo. If they have a nice smile, believe it or not, uh, a 16 year old came to see me once and said, I chose you out of four other people because I liked your smile. I'm like, okay, you know, here's to these curly whites. But I think it's really important to uh, reach out to that therapist, either by email, but I would suggest a phone call, right? Because there's so much nuance that gets lost in the written word, right? Get a 15 minute consult, they're usually free, right? Ask the therapist what you specialize in, talk about what some of your struggles are, and see if you can get a nice feel. You know, ask them, are you experienced in this issue, right? Are you experienced in what I am dealing with? Your ther the, the person might ask you, the therapist might ask you a few questions like, are you on medication for your mental health? Have you been hospitalized in the past six months for your mental wellness? Are you having any suicidal ideation, right? These are things that they need to know so they can assess how acute your issues are or whether or not they need to send you packing to the nearest hospital emergency room right away. Right, so that 50 minute phone call is really important. And if you, you know, have that call, it doesn't mean that you have to take them on as your therapist or see them right away because usually they're not free, right? So um, I would encourage you to connect with someone. If you didn't like that phone call, connect with someone else, right? Um, and also too, I will say, let's say you land on a therapist that you think you like and you have your first two sessions and you're like, mm. I'm not feeling that. It's okay, you're not married to them. It's okay to say, you know, I'm, you don't even have to say anything to them, right? If you have another session scheduled, just call and cancel, or go online and cancel, and see if you can connect with someone. I'm a therapist and I have a therapist. 
And I went through four people before I found someone that I like. Now she's my person, <laughs> right? She helps me keep it together, right? And so I encourage you to connect until you find someone that works for you. Now, that being said, therapy is not cheap. I think we all know <laughs> that therapy is not cheap. There are some community agencies that offer low cost or no cost therapy. Granted, there may be a wait list. You may have to wait three months, six months. Unfortunately, an agency that I used to work for, I recently found out that their waiting list is as long as a year. That is um, unfortunate because I tell people, by the time someone calls a therapist, they needed someone like last week, right? You have come to the end of the end of the end of everything that you know how to do and you're desperate. You need someone right away. So I would say if you uh, reach out to a therapist and your means are limited, ask them if they have a sliding scale. Ask them if they have someone on their team that does low cost. Sometimes therapists will have a student in their practice and that student might take one either for free or for lower cost, right? So there are some options that are out there available to you. And you know, you can see someone at that lower cost until you max out your budget. But in the meantime, before you see someone at lower cost, get your name on that wait list at the free agency and you know, continue to do what you can within your budget until your name comes up to the top and then you can access some of that free support, right? So I challenge you, I encourage you, I invite you to take care of your wellness. You know, as black individuals, as Dr. Christie said, we face so many struggles and challenges, right? Um, particularly throughout the pandemic, particularly when all of these things that are happening in the news, be careful about what you consume. I was talking this morning with someone in the media about this new phenomenon, well, it's not new, but the name is fairly new, a phenomenon called linked fate, which is when, um, something happens in the news, something uh, detrimental, that happens in the news, and you identify with that person because they look like you, or they have a strong similarity to you, and you start thinking, is that gonna happen to me? Is that gonna happen to my partner? Is that gonna happen to my child? And we start to be fearful. You know, your 16-year-old asks for the keys, and you're like, mm, no, I'll come with you, right? You start to teach your sons how to behave if they are in, in, interacting with police. Right, so we have to be careful about the things that we consume. I encourage you to have some kind of balance. Life is really hard, right? Mm -hmm. But then we get to do things like this. We connect with beautiful, amazing, brilliant people, right? Do what you can to create as much balance for yourself in your life. Go out dancing, listen to some music, talk to a friend, have some good food. Have you tasted that cheesecake? Oh my <laughs> goodness, it will change your life, right? Um, do what you can to create some balance for yourself. And um, if you need some help, if you want to connect afterwards and you know, talk to me about whatever, I'm here. Um, as mentioned, there are therapists available uh, provided through Amnesty International. So get yourself some support, get your loved ones some support, and I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Stacey Ann Buchanan. So a little bit about Stacey. Um, her impact and achievements have led her to being selected as one of 100 black women to watch in Canada, one of the 150 black women making Canada better, and one of 150 leading Canadians for mental health and presenting a TEDx talk. Her award-winning documentary, The Blind Stigma, made Canadian history when it debuted as the first documentary produced in Canada that takes an in-depth look at how mental health is perceived within the black community, or black communities, I should say. Uh, it also cemented Stacian as a documentary filmmaker and mental health advocate. So a little bit about what Stacian will speak to. She'll share her story and journey addressing her own mental health. Um, also her journey in getting healing and what, has, what she has found that continues to sustain her. She'll also speak about the stigma she experienced and have some guidelines and thoughts about how we can support someone dealing with mental health challenges and wellness. All right. Woo! <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Happy Black History Month. Um, I want to start off my talk by asking a question. And I want you to shout out anything that comes to your mind. This is not something that I want you to think about at all, OK? What do you think a person who is suicidal or depressed looks like? 
Okay, so I struggle with anxiety. It's something that I live with, and it's something that I know how to maintain, and I know how to tap into something that I call a mental health toolbox. So it's just like some things that um, Dr. Chrissy and Dr. Roxanne, Roxanne has talked about, and um, know when to pull out what I need for my mental health. So I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. So I'll say my journey started in 2011 when I decided that I was going to pack up and leave Toronto and move to Vancouver to pursue an acting career. I went to school for acting, so I went to school for film and television and for theater, and that's all I really knew. And I figured, you know what, I was about to turn 30, and I was like, I, I, I got to get out there because, you know, the, 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 the number 30 was just so scary. And I mean, my friends around me were getting married. They had careers and, any, and everything, and I didn't have anything. And I figured I needed a career. I also figured that moving to Vancouver will make me super famous like Halle Berry. We share the same birthday, so we should share the same <laughs> success, right? So I moved to Vancouver. I gave myself six months to make it super famous. Six months. I'm like, I got to do this. You know, I was getting little commercials here and there. You know, I got a part in Twilight. I played a Volturi vampire. You know, I was doing a little thing here and there. <laughs> I noticed little things about my body. I noticed that I was doing things fast. I was talking really fast. I couldn't sleep. I was eating fast. I was walking fast, just fast. I had a roommate at the time because Vancouver is so expensive, still is. And um, she said, I told her about what was happening, and she was studying to be a nurse. And she said, you're showing the signs of anxiety. And I remember going into my room and thinking to myself, anxiety? White girls get that. Never heard of a black person going through anxiety. Anxiety, never heard of a black person talking about anxiety in 2011. I decided that I need to check myself in the hospital because my, my symptoms were getting so fast. And I want to describe anxiety to you when, you're, when, you, when it's propelled at a heavy state. So I want you to take a journey with me. And just so you can just, I just want to take you on a journey of how I felt. So I want you to close your eyes for me, please. And I want you to picture your heart is in a cage. And your heart is beating a million miles per second, okay? With every beat that it beats, your heart gets bigger and bigger, but the cage gets smaller and smaller. Mm. Open your eyes. Mm. That's what I went through. That's what I lived through, and I couldn't understand it. I decided that I really need to check myself in the hospital. They ran every test on me, blood test. They, they did a SCAT scan. They did everything, and I was healthy, but it came back that I did have anxiety, and they prescribed Valium for me. Mm. And I remember looking at the prescription and thinking to myself, I remember doing a scene in acting school, you know, and, and this is a crazy people drug. They're telling me I'm crazy. <laughs> so I'm going to beat this. I'm going to repeat mind over matter, mind over matter. And I beat it. And I know that day specifically. You know how I remember that day? It was the day that Prince William and Kate got married. <laughs> Look it up. It was that day. I was, uh, I was, uh, it was in Vancouver. And I was like, I was coming from the hospital. I'm like, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to watch this wedding. And I'm going to beat this. Um, I'm more decolonized now, so I don't watch that stuff. Like, okay. um, <laughs> um, so... I, I remember that day, and I, I beat my anxiety for a whole week, you know, and then it came back. It came back with a vengeance, and I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't eat, and so they, they brought, I went back to the hospital, and they had me hooked up to a thread mill, and, they, and, they were, and I was walking, and they were checking my heart rate, and they were just wondering, what is going on? Why my heart was going so fast? I had to bring home a heart monitor, and to sleep with it, and then to check in with the doctor. Eventually, I realized that I had to go back home to Toronto because I wasn't well, and although I made lifelong friends in, in Vancouver, I needed family support, so I moved back to Toronto. And the thought of moving back to Toronto as a quote unquote loser because I didn't get the success that I wanted spiraled that anxiety now into depression. My depression came into two stages. We know about the depression where you're, you're at home, the lights are, um, the blinds are off, you're not eating, or sometimes you're eating yourself silly, you're not showering for days, you're not brushing your teeth for days, you don't want to talk to anybody. I'm a Leo, I love to talk, and I wasn't picking up my phone, I wasn't returning texts, I was just shut down. 
the other part of me, the other part of depression, which, we, which is known as the, it's not clinically diagnosed, but it's called the smile in depression. It's a high function in depression. Mm -hmm. It's the one where I was going out and I was making sure that my hair was slayed to the gods, my makeup was done, I was wearing expensive clothes from head to toe, I was going out, I was partying, I was dancing a lot. It's because I knew I was ill on the inside and I tried to mask it, a facade of a best life. I'm living my best life, I'm enjoying everything. I, I think that if I fake that I was happy, eventually I'll be happy. When you talk about mental health at the time, I come from, a, I'm Jamaican, and so I was raised by a single father, a Rastafarian <laughs> Jamaican man, so you, he doesn't play. But my dad was the only person that I felt safe to talk to. I was even a relationship, in a relationship, and I couldn't talk to my partner at the time. My dad was the only one because I felt the stigma of being judged, of being shamed. So I went to my dad, I said, Daddy, I don't like how I'm feeling, I'm having really negative thoughts. I, I can you just please help me? My dad said, drink some tea or read your Bible. <laughs> and I drank tea after tea after tea, I read my Bible, nothing was working. I went back again and I said, Daddy, it's not working, like I'm, I'm, I'm really not feeling well, like what can I do to help? My dad said, drink some tea, read your Bible and pray. I did all three, it wasn't working. The last time I went back to my dad, I think I was like at the last straw. And I'm trying not to cry, but I will cry because it okay. lets out, okay. it lets it out. When you're living with depression, and I, and I want to say that I, my mind was plagued by suicidal thoughts every day. Suicide ideation was just in my mind, and I'll tell you why. I came here from Jamaica, and as an immigrant child, you feel like you have so much pressure to make it. You're like the one of you that came to big, big foreign, you know, you have to do well, you have to. And so I put all this pressure on myself, especially turning 30, that I needed to do this for my family. I needed them to be so proud of me, you know? So I was battling that internal battle inside. And I didn't tell this to my dad, but I was telling my dad that, Daddy, I don't feel well. My dad said the most ignorant thing that ended up saving my life. My dad said, since you like to chat so much, how about you tell your business to strangers? He said that because his fear was that if I told a friend, that friend is gonna tell another friend, then another friend, and another friend, and somehow it's gonna go back down to Jamaica that he's raising a mad child and that he failed. It wasn't really about me, it's about him and that he failed as a parent, as a single parent trying to do well and bring his kids here. What I, that actually happened to me where I, I was, um, I used to ride a subway all the time and I used to wear sunglasses because I used to cry so much. So the sunglasses hid my pain. And one time I went to the park and I was sitting there in the park and I was just crying and a lady came over and sat beside me, just like, <laughs> just like Nicole is doing right now. And she said, and she said, what's wrong? Mm. And I just blurted out everything. Mm. I just told her everything. And the beauty about telling her that was like, I felt safe because she didn't know me. She didn't know my name, she was gonna go back and say this. I felt safe because the stigma of shame and the veil of shame that we wear in the black community, it, it was gone for that moment because I was like, I felt like I could trust you because you won't tell anybody about my business. And telling her that, I just felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. And so for the longest while, I used strangers as my therapist. I used them as a way to let it out because I needed to share what was happening. Fast forward now, a few months, I, I decided that, you know, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to Mexico to, sh to, to celebrate my 30th birthday. And before I turn 30, I always do this thing. Every, the last day of, my, of that year before I turn, before my birthday comes, I always give gratitude to God and I pray to God. And this time I prayed and I cried and I said, God, what am I put here for? I needed to know my purpose and I needed to know my journey because everyone is put here for a divine purpose and I need to know now. I don't want to know when I'm 50 or when I'm 60. Please tell me now. I fell asleep and I woke up to something on the television called actors who have made it by doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. I took that as a sign. I came back to Toronto. My friend was hosting an event. He said, do you want to be my co-host? I said, sure. I host, co-hosted the event with him. The owner came up to me and he said, you know, I know you're an actress and a model. If you ever want to do your own event, you can put it on here at my place. I was like, I never put on events. I, I go to events. I used to have a, I used to have business card that says Stacey M. Buchanan, aspiring actress, actress, and I used to go to like TIFF and like hand it to people. Like I was just one of those people that was always, I really wanted that, you know? And I thought to myself, I'm gonna do an event. 
I'm going to do a really big event. I'm going to combine all the elements of art into one production. I'm going to call it the mystic effect. I'm going to name it after Vancouver because Vancouver, Vancouver was such a mystical city for me. You notice I'm talking fast? It's my anxiety, okay? Just, just bear with me. But I'm also trying to watch the time and speed up and make sure that I'm mindful of everyone everyone's time. So um, I decided to call the event the mystic effect. I combine music, poetry, dance, fashion, and film. And I decided that I wasn't going to use anybody that was famous in the city. I was going to use all no names. I was going to use people that are the underdog because I believe that those people have such a drive and a hunger and they just want the opportunity. Some people said, no, Stacey Ann, it's not going to work. You need to put one big name on, your, on, that, on that flyer so people can come out and support. I said, no, 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 no. I'm just going to do this. The day of the event, I stood at the door with my friend Chris, who was, um, who was my security guard. And we had to turn people away because the place was so packed. It was full. And this is something that I only shared about a year ago. When I did that event on March 25th, 2012, I know dates because I keep a journal. <laughs> keep a journal, y'all, because it will save you. Um, when I did that event, I remember, actually, when, actually my best friend is in the house, and he was, he was my um, um, videographer and supporter throughout it. And when I did the event, every single person, after it, everyone gave me a standing ovation. Mm. It was so well done. And every single person in that room saved my life without knowing it, because right after that event, I was going to end it all. Mm. Because I, I wanted to leave people with something to remember me by, and I figured if I do something, because I truly believe that living a fulfillment life, I was telling Dr. Chrissy, is to be of servitude to others. Mm -hmm. And I figured if I do this event where people can feel amazing and the underdog can feel amazing, mm -hmm. I can then feel good about ending my life. And when people said, you have to do it again, Stacey Ann, mm -hmm. that's what saved my life today. And that's why I'm here today. I said, okay, the next year I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the fashion show again and I'm going to create a production company. I'm going to open up a production company. And when I announced it on social media, you know, there are so many people that were congratulating me, but there was like one person was like, who is this Stacey M. Buchanan? Where did she come from? And people don't know that it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. People think that it just comes up and, and people never see the grind and the sweat and the tears. They only see the shine. And it, why is it that as human beings, you can have a million people saying you're amazing and the one person that says you're not amazing, you fixate on that. And I remember I was so fixated on that and so hurt. And I was like, daddy did this. And I went to my dad and I said, daddy, this person, they don't even know that I, that I wasn't even supposed to be here. They don't even know. Why are they saying this? My dad said something to me. He said, there are two things in life you can never control. What people say about you and what people think about you. You can only control your reaction. So I said, okay, I'm going to react. And I reacted by creating a documentary that talked about how mental health is viewed in the, in the black community. At first I wanted to make, write a book, but I said, nah, I'm a little bit more creative. I'm gonna make a documentary, and how I'm gonna do this, I took a year and I, and I was silently watching people on social media that were talking about mental health, black people. This was in 2013, nobody was doing that. Mm -hmm. Very few people were being open about it because there was a, still the shame. Mm -hmm. And I wanna say something, mental illness in the black community is the number one silent killer. Mm -hmm because we don't talk about it, and we don't talk about it because we think we're the only ones here. We only think that we're the only ones going through it. And I'm telling you now, you are not alone. Yeah. You are never alone. Mm -hmm. I started um, seeing people that were talking about it, and so I reached out to um, the people that were talking about it, Pollyanna Reed, Siobhan John, you know, one lady I met in the elevator of me going to an event, and then I found one black man to be on it. I know so many friends that were going through stuff, but nobody wanted to come on camera and share about it. So I saw, I, I had one friend that said, yes, he's going to do it. I said, okay, now I have the people. I, I want to create, I want to talk about mental health in the black community, but I have to show the two spectrums, the therapist, which no one wants to talk about, and the church. Because you got to bring it there's so many times, you know, the therapist or the church. And when you, when you break your foot or you cut your foot, you go to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a doctor for your physical being, you could have a doctor for your mental well-being as well. So I wanted to make sure that was there. I wanted to get the opinion of people off the street. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I have this. You know, I'm going to make it off my credit cards. No problem. I'm going to do this all by myself. But I need someone to direct it because I've never directed anything before, and I don't think I could do it. I reached out to a director, and I said, I told him what I wanted to do, and I laid out the plan, and he said, why don't you make it about uh, the plethora of people in Toronto? Toronto is a melting pot. Use all the different cultures and make it about that. I said, I spent a year researching this. 
about mental health in the black community. I, I really want to do this. He said, well, the black community does not support the black community. Mm -mm. And I was so distraught. And I remember my dad calling me and he's like, oh, you're still going to do the documentary? I said, no, daddy, the black community does not support the black community. I'm not going to do it. And my dad said, you're mad. <laughs> <laughs> you went through all of that. Yeah. You went through all of that. God gave you this vision for a reason. You have to do with the documentary. And by the time I was just done with my dad and it's just like <laughs> prophesizing and saying all these things. And I said, Daddy, are you going to come in that documentary? Are you going to tell people how you treated me when I needed you the most? And my dad said, yes. Mm. I named the documentary The Blind Stigma. I named it after my dad, your dad, your mom, your uncles, your aunts, your sisters, your cousin. Everybody who purposely turns a blind eye to mental health in the black community. The documentary opened up on February 15, 20, February 7, 2015. Remember, I told you I'm good with dates. It was a <laughs> snowstorm. It was a so snow, snowstorm that day. And the community came out and showed up. The theater held about 400 people, and it was packed. People were outside. People showed up and supported that documentary. And... And the documentary even went on to win an award and, and, and made Canadian history. I was doing an interview with the Huffington Post, and they said, this is a part of Canadian history because this is the first that this has ever been done. Mm -hmm. From there, my career then propelled me into being a mental health advocate, something that I never even really thought about. Because remember, I told you I was going to be like Halle Berry. <laughs> but with this, with this job of being an advocate, it comes a great responsibility. And there's a lot of things that I had to learn, even the words and what I say. Instead of saying, oh, I suffer from anxiety, I say mm -hmm. I struggle with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying crazy, I never use the word crazy anymore because I realize how detrimental that word can be. You know, um, when 2020 happened, I realized that a lot, of, a lot of what I was going through and how I was functioning was I live with high-functioning anxiety. When the pandemic happened and there was a lockdown, so many people were saying, I didn't know I had anxiety, you know, I never knew I had depression or something. You did, you actually did have it. See, the thing is, because the world was not closed up, you were just going, going, going. Mm -hmm. My anxiety fueled my ambition. And so it made me kept on going because I didn't know how to say no. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the boundaries like you talked about, Rex, and to say no, even no to myself. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was living on a culture of the grind and hustle culture. Mm -hmm. I had to learn to unsubscribe from that culture and subscribe to the alignment culture. Mm -hmm. So now I just say no. I say no unless it aligns with my journey. Yeah. From, from being a mental health advocate, my work has now gone into decolonizing how mental health is viewed in the black community. Mm -hmm. And because I truly believe that in order for you to know where you're going in life, you have to know where you're coming yeah. from. You have to know that we are struggling with inter intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. that is built into us. Yeah. So when we see a black man on TV being lynched, we understand, we feel it too, because it's a part of our journey and part of our generation of what we've been through. You have to understand the foods that we eat. Mm -hmm. A lot of the foods that we eat, I love my yam and banana and dumpling and aki, but when we eat those things in the morning time, remember, our, our, our enslaved, and another thing, I had to change my vocabulary. We were not slaves, we were enslaved, because yes, they nobody yes. sign up for this. When we, we have to understand that the foods that we ate, when we eat, eat those heavy foods, we ate them in the mornings because we were working from dusk up, from morning till night. Mm -hmm. So we needed something to sustain us. So it's okay if we eat healthy. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, 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 on demystifying the strong black woman myth. Yes. Come on. We should be soft. Yes. We need to rest. Like Dr. Christie said, we have to rest. Rest is the biggest form of resistance that you can do in a world that is plagued and built on capitalism and white supremacy. The way that you can, you can, you can resist that and fight against that is to rest. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors have done enough. Mm -hmm. It's okay because when you rest, trust me, all your vision and everything will come to you. You have to understand that every, we're, we're given a birthright. Mm -hmm. and, and I truly believe that you don't need to chase anything. Just let it come to you. And there's so much more that I can say, but I don't want to take up the time because I'm so passionate about this. <laughs> but I, I want to end on one thing. Um, you are never, ever, ever alone. Yeah. Mental health doesn't have a look. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not the haggard person that I thought growing up in Jamaica, walking down the street with a tear up pants or something. No, mm -hmm. it is somebody that looks exactly like me. And we need to bring back collective care in our community. Collective, there's no more shaming. 
There's no more shaming because we all have our struggles and the struggles has no competition. There's no competition in struggles. Mm -hmm. We're all going through it and we need to just help each other and, and exercise community care. Yeah. Thank you for your time. All right. I appreciate Woo! it. Well done. Maybe we'll just sit in it. Um, I want to throw things off to Nicole Waldron, um, who I also learned through a podcast has had a chance to sit down with each one of these individuals. So you should definitely check out the podcast and listen to all of those episodes. Uh, I certainly will be. Um, so Nicole is a professional event planning specialist, an inspirational speaker, a podcaster, author, and community advocate. Nicole works tirelessly for the advancement, progress, and pos prosperity of her community. She's the, she is the host of the Victory Speaks podcast, an online show that provides listeners the tools to live with a victory mindset. She's an advocate at heart. She works to raise awareness on all of the important issues, but I will enumerate them. Affordable and co-op housing, mental health, mental health for family and caregivers, issues affecting women and young people in the community. Um, Nicole also serves on various boards and committees in Toronto. So Nicole will be touching on various themes, including the caregiver experience through her own journey and barriers to care. She'll speak to the support that employers need to be providing for caregivers and how friends and the community can support families going through mental health challenges and supporting those with mental health challenges. She'll also share some resources where families can get some support. So throwing it off to Nicole, thank you so much. There's a resounding yes. Well, good evening, everyone. And hasn't the the panelists so far been super califragilistic as Bialadocious. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We are talking about one of the toughest topics in the world. Um, and it's taboo everywhere, no matter what your race or your culture is. I'm going to do my very best to share this journey with you. It's a topic I'm so passionate about. And Roxanne, oh my God, I don't know. You know how you went off topic? Some of you may hear my Trini accent come out sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, Dr. Chrissy, you know, she has had the ability to help me also in my advocacy to get people to understand our mind is our brain and our brain is our mind. And the only other person that helped me to understand that, that was Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Mm. And that our brains are neuroplastic. And you know... Life is funny. It's a journey that we just never know how the dots connect. And I realize as I look at my life and I look back at my life and I reflect, it was preparing me to be a mom like this. So I kind of say this topic I call leading while bleeding, mm. a caregiver's journey and mental health. 28 years ago, I became a mom for the first time. Seven years ago, I became a mom for the first time. Mm. Now, I'm going to cry. I'm going to tell you. Get your, just, um, I can't promise you I won't cry. I can't promise you won't cry because this is going to, I'm going to keep it real. Mm. Now, that sounds odd, doesn't it? And why it sounds odd? It's because 28 years ago, I gave birth to the most amazing baby boy. Right? I, I had dreams just like every other mom. He's going to be this, he's going to be that, you know. He's going to be married one day. And, you know, I took time to name him. I did. I went back into my African roots, and I took seven days. And I looked at his personality, and his name means peace. Mm. And for 20 years, he lived a peaceful life. He was athletic. He was strong. He was bold. He was funny. He was, he was a young man who just thrived. And now you hear me say was, he's not dead, he's alive. But the 20 year old changed seven years ago. Mm. He changed seven years ago after he was living on his own, you know, 
doing construction, living with his best friend downtown in a condominium, and they were having the time of their lives. I didn't even know what the heck was going on. I had to learn how to release and let go. Mm -hmm. How do you release and let go when you have a 20-year-old? Well, you have a friend called Joan Pierre who released and let go of her daughter when she was <laughs> 18 years old, right? So you learn from the mentors in your society. And so his life was changing and it was evolving. And at the end of 2015, he was doored in a bicycle accident. Mm. Now, let me go back a little bit. When he was, he was such an athlete, he did everything. Well, almost everything. And he wanted to play rugby, and I was like, that's the one thing I don't want you to do. Please, mm. I beg you, please. He played football. I hated football. And you know, my good friend Pinball said to me, Nicole, let him play football. Let him play football. Diane, his wife, said to me, no, let him. It's well protected. And I said, okay. But I said, son, don't do rugby. And you know, you don't really see many black kids playing rugby, right? Mm -hmm. But he was obedient and disobedient at the same time. He went and he played rugby on the school feed, and somebody fell on his face. And he broke his face in grade 9. So I learned from grade 9 how to get a little bit of backbone, right? Now, I had to tell you that bit of the backstory. So fast forward to age 20, and he gets doored riding down Young Street, black male, and doesn't decide to put on the helmet. Mm. Don't we tell them, put on your helmet? No, he didn't put on the helmet that day. And unfortunately, that day, he was doored and he flipped. Mm. And this was really my, um, you know, conscious awareness of being black, being male, being in the healthcare system. Mm. And so he went to the hospital didn't call his mom because he's the guy now, right? He doesn't need mom's help. And the ambulance took him. They wrote a little note of paper as to who hit him. And they released him in a few hours. Mm. Now, you heard he was doored, right? Riding his bike at full speed. And so he went home to his friend and he didn't call mom. I was working in Ottawa at the Senate. He was like, he and butter and mom, he could take care of himself. And what ended up happening was he went home in pain. Mm. What we know now that we didn't know then, it took us a year to find out, is that he re-injured his face and he ended up with trigeminal nerve pain. So the, the f I'm going to just pull the mic away so it was like a heart. Because when he broke his face, it was a heart and he had had operations for that face. He left the hospital, a year, we didn't know this at the time, um, with a concussion, traumatic brain injury, mm. a torn rotator cup, uh, uh, which they never took care of, a torn PL. PLC, and we didn't know. He didn't know. So he went home, he self-medicated, and, you know, good old friends, yeah, try some cannabis, right? So, right, he did that, age 20, young brain. And so this hospital released this black young man with dreads because, you know what, when we're black, we don't feel pain. Mm. It's, it's something that we also deal with in mental health. You know, recently, we, you know, we just had a talk with one of the bioethicists. There's a thing called a bioethicist. Look it up. <laughs> at, um, at CAMH. And, you know, one of the things that is being realized and actualized is that pain is very big when it comes to racialization mm -hmm. in the healthcare system. And, and as I say to you as an advocate, 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 advocate. If you are going to hospital, mental health or physical, you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So we fast forward, he comes home, treats himself, and then he realizes he can't work. Mm. And now he has to give up his independence of living downtown and he has to move back home. But I'm living in Ottawa, right? Mm. Picture this, I'm living in Ottawa. And then I start seeing things manifesting on great old social media. Because you know our young people, right? We love to tell our stories on social media. And he was displaying conversations, actions that just didn't make sense. I remember one day, you see how we're looking here? So pretend this is his bedroom, and that's the living room. And I was watching, and that's the TV just like it is over there, and I was literally seeing the TV through the walls of his room. Mm. And that was his first episode of psychosis. Mm. And it was a culmination of many things happening at the same time. And this is why it's important to know the function of the brain. And I'm glad that I learned that along the way. And I continue to learn 
why the brain is so important. But nobody was talking to me about the brain because we have, I really believe in, in our system, if we understood that mental illness is a brain disease that affects the mind, we would break so many stigmas. If we understood how the chemicals work and why we have to do what we had to do, I would have done diff things differently from the very beginning. I would have even done things differently for myself as a caregiver because I wasn't taking care of myself because I didn't understand what was happening. I was in flight and fright mode and every other mode that they can think of. And so I was fortunate enough to be living in co-op housing, had neighbors that knew him, community. You heard that word, right? Community. The community knew him and they knew something was wrong. And my family lived in the same building and they called and they, they, they got him to the hospital. And so FYI, when you call someone with a mental health crisis, it comes with the paramedics and the police. Mm -hmm. Two things can happen. Mm -hmm. They either go to the hospital in restraints on the bed or they go to the hospital in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. So just be prepared. And that's because it's a safety issue. You don't know what's gonna happen. They don't know what's gonna happen and you just have to learn that that's just the, the way the game works. The interesting thing was when we see, you know, being black, being male in the health system is I was rushing home from now Ottawa on a train and he's in the hospital. And basically what happens is, by the time I get to the hospital, within, a, within hours, we meet him walking in the corridor. And I'm like, where are you going? And he looks nothing like, you knew something was wrong. And when somebody's in mania or psychosis, their whole face changes. It's a whole different personality. Mm -hmm. And they, my sister and I walking down the car, where are you going? I'm going home. And he leaves and he jumps in the cab and he's gone. And I'm trying to find out what in the world just happened. And they are not willing to talk to me because I'm the black mom. You know the angry black mom thing? That's the other thing you got to face, the angry black woman. That's the other thing that our trauma, our race, our history it is following us in many ways. And we have to learn in this system as we go along the journey. One of the things and one of the reasons I've become an advocate in this is for the education piece of teaching people how to be culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate care. That's one of the things we are, we are working on so diligently. Because when I showed up there, no one was talking to me. I'm like, where's the doctor? Can I talk to the doctor? Well, no, ma'am, you know, you got the, well, no. And I'm like, no, where's the doctor? What's the doctor's name? And I happened to hear, after they told me the doctor's name, I literally heard him in the background. I was like, oh, you were my son's doctor. And he's like, yes. And I'm like, okay, let me tell you, that's not the angry black child. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong. And it was only until I said that, stepped up as a caregiver, had to put my feelings aside. And I thank God for my mom who just told me and show up in the world, you, you know, there's no judgment. It is so important as parents, as black parents of African and Caribbean heritage, that we put this nonsense aside about judging. We have to put it aside. Mm -hmm. We have to do it gently, of course, because we understand where it comes from, right? We, we come from a background where we've had to survive. We come from a background where we've had to live and where we have to be strong. We have to show up strong. This is why I call it leading while bleeding, right? Because we're always leading, but we're bleeding at the same time, trying to survive. And so it was at that point in time that they actually made an appointment for us and we ended up in the journey in the mental health care system. Mm -hmm. It's been a seven year journey going on eight. And throughout that time, I have learned so much about this process. I have learned that advocacy is key, especially for young black men, for young black women, because they have an idea of who we are or what we are or what we're supposed to be. We don't always get the care that we need. We are standing and we're waiting and, and waiting in, in lines just like everybody else. But when we get to the table, we may not get the right doctor. Mm -hmm. We may not get the right care. I remember waiting for years for CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And let me tell you something. Look up Cognitive Behavioral Therapy because it's something that we all need to do. I learned that because it's how we learn. And if we understand that, we will do ourselves a really good favor. And knowing what he had, and now throughout this whole journey, they're not treating the traumatic brain injury. Mm. Nobody's dealing with any other stuff. I'm trying to figure this out myself. 
Nobody's telling me about medication, what the medication means. Nobody's telling me about side effects. We're figuring this out along the way. They gave me a resident. In fact, it really wasn't a resident. It was an intern who was somehow, you know, doing their stuff in school, mm. meeting this young black boy and man. I should say man because he was 20, but he was by 20, 22 at the time, who wouldn't listen. Who would, when I say, he needs support. So even when you meet with him by himself, I need to know the homework because he, he has no memory. Because one of the things that happens with di depression mm -hmm. and bipolar, which he was mm -hmm. first diagnosed with, was no second diagnosis, is that your memory is compromised. But she wouldn't give me the homework. So he went through CBT that we waited on for a year, but it was useless because nobody was listening. Let me go back in the story a minute. Hold on. I remember when the first diagnosis came. We were at SAPASI. Now, SAPASI is a program at CAMH for African, Caribbean, Canadian youth for addiction and mental health. It was started about 30 years ago. It's probably one of the only programs of its kind. And it's expanding. And the social worker came with me, and they were helping me because at one point in time, the, c the mental health hospital said, you know, we have a catchment area. He, you know, he doesn't fit the catchment area. But they allowed him into this program because there was no catchment area. And so we went to the doctor, and this doctor refused to meet with myself and the black social worker, male, mm. good looking just like you. <laughs> <laughs> and 15 minutes later, he came out and said, oh, your son has schizophrenia. I said, excuse me? Wow. I said, have you spoken to me yet? Do you know what's happening? Did, okay, I said, okay, you don't want to talk to me? Talk to the social worker. No, he has schizophrenia, that's it. Wow. And we were dismissed. Go ahead now. That, 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 that's where you go. So here's another thing, too, about the mental health system that we deal with in this beautiful Canadian country, which is even worse for when you're black. Mm -hmm. It's this thing called consent and capacity mm -hmm. and privacy. Talk about it. I'm going to talk about it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even feel like I need my notes anymore because I think I've gone off my notes, but I'm still in my notes. So we are all looking at the TV and we're seeing people that are unwell on the streets, in the TTC, and we're walking in fear. And a lot of us judge them, and we don't even know it could be somebody's son, we forget it's somebody's daughter. They're, they're human, and we dehumanize them. And I think one of my fears has always been, you know, if he ends up unwell, and he's not doing well and goes into mania and in paranoia, he could be one of those people, yeah. right? He may not necessarily be violent, but he could end up because he's confused and he doesn't know himself. So what happens with consent and capacity is, if a person is, goes into hospital with a mental illness, just like if you go in for a checkup with cancer, you need permission to talk to family. That sounds reasonable, right? You, wouldn't, you, wanna, you don't want everybody knowing your business. But what if your loved one goes into hospital and they're paranoid? Right. What if they think they're on fire? What if they think they're someone else? Do you know that person has the right to tell a clinician not to talk to you? Yep. Do you know that I have to get, or families have to get their permission in order to know what medications they're on, what their diagnosis is, and they could leave the hospital mm -hmm. and come home and you are clueless in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Unless a person is deemed basically a danger to themselves or to others, they can be released from hospital unwell. Yeah. And that's what we're facing. So imagine a lot of our young black men and women, this is happening to consistently, and guess what happens? They're criminalized. Mm -hmm. They end up in the criminal justice system, and this is why so many of our young people are in the criminal justice system, because they look at us, and you know, yes, there are people who just up to mischief, don't get me wrong, but I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about individuals who are unwell for whatever reason, whether they're having an episode because they're schizophrenic, Bipolar, they have a concurrent disorder, they have an addiction. Addiction, yes, people, addiction is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism actually is more of an addiction than drugs, than the cocaine and crack you see on the street. We, we accept alcoholism, we accept smoking, but we don't accept crack and cocaine. Because you know what? It's their fault mm -hmm. that they made a choice. And we forget that they get addicted. Mm -hmm. Anyways. So this is what caregivers like myself have to go through and are going through daily, and while you're doing this, while you're a black parent, you, have, you run the risk at times, even in hospital, even dealing with clinicians, 
as being coined difficult. Yes, I have the label. I'm the difficult mom. Literally recently, in a recent hospitalization, the nurses actually turned to my son and said, tell your mom not to call anymore. Wow. She's calling too much. Wow. And I said, I, I called and I said, excuse me? Mm. Now, mind you, they denied him his pain medication for, for nine days, six days. He didn't get his antipsychotic medication for four days. So I'm calling. Of course. I'm calling. I said, did you just tell my son not to call me? I can't call the nurse's station. They said, yes, ma'am. We, we, you were a topic of discussion this mm. morning at rounds. This is what trauma looks like for caregivers. And here's the sad thing about it is, our loved ones can get care, but there's no care in place for caregivers in this country right. unless you can pay for it. So you know when you get cancer, God forbid anybody gets cancer, you can go to the Princess Margaret Hospital, and they say, family, come sit down. Let's find support. I know I have people who have been there, and I've been there at the Princess Margaret Hospital with my dad. And I sat down, and they gave me even a glass of juice. How can we help you? When you're a caregiver, you go into the emergency ward, and you sit by yourself. Mm. And you're locked, in a, you're locked in an area, and nobody can come in, mm. and nobody can talk to you. That is the reality. And when you're doing it while you're black, the judgment from, your, from not just yourself, your judgment from your family, friends, society, because we have to recognize, as Stacey Ann said, that what's wrong with you? Suck it up. Mm -hmm. We went through more than this. We did this. We have to remember the things that we said. We understand. But this is a different world. It's not the same world. And yes, there are different challenges. But people are going through real trauma. They're dealing with social media. They're seeing, they're experiencing wars. We have refugees that come into this country and I'm watching them and I'm watching the pain and they are demonized and they are in the forensic system in our hospitals. And when you end up in the forensic system in our hospitals, it's the worst place you can end up when you have a mental illness because you can stay there for a long time. And it's a very lonely place. Stigma, we have to destroy the stigma mm -hmm. of mental health, especially in the black community because it is hindering the care of our loved ones, and it is hindering the care of caregivers. I say to you this, show up. Show up for caregivers. We are not invited to conversations. I've pushed myself into many conversations, and this is where I, I sit at the table, probably as the only black person on the FAC at CAMH. I sit at the table for the Ontario Caregivers Organization on their board. I sit at the table at Stella's place, and my son doesn't even get care at Stella's place because I know that the voice, the black voice, has to be heard. Even when I'm tired, I know for a fact, and, and I say to you, if you're an employer, show grace. Mm -hmm. Show grace to someone who's a caregiver, and especially mm -hmm. if they have a loved one with a mental illness. They may not be able to tell you because there's all not just stigma on themselves, but stigma on their loved one. Because when they are feeling well, and if my loved one happens to come and say, Ketty, can I get a job? Now, Ketty, thank God, Ketty, Ketty is non-judgmental. But if you were dealing with a, a judgmental person, they could come and say, well, you know what, isn't your mom, but your mom is, and then they start thinking back to, mm -hmm. this was the child that was displaying on social media, mm -hmm. right? So I take a risk every time I speak about myself, but more importantly, when I speak about my son's journey. But now because he's been very vocal about certain things, I'm speaking about it in public spaces where I couldn't speak before. I say to you, show up for caregivers, give them grace. You may have loved ones with suicidal ideation. When they need to take time off, it's not a vacation day, it's not a sick day. They may need to work, they need flexible time, they need flexible hours. Mm -hmm. Give them the ability in the workspace for, and I thank God for Amnesty saying tonight, if you need help, if you need someone to talk to, we're going to pay for it. Not many people do that. Mm -hmm. Not many insurance companies are even taking that on. This is big. If you have a friend, show up. You know, many times people have said to me, Nicole, what do you want? I don't know what I want at that time. My brain right. is not working. My brain, I, I burn water. Joan laughs at me. She can't understand but I'm burning water. But what Joan has done is showed up with a meal. What Emily has done is baked me a lasagna. But let me tell you, the bad joke 
for caregivers is nobody shows up with a casserole. Mm -hmm. Nobody, whether you're white or black. We sit and live in isolation. People cannot handle our story. You've just gotten a snippet of my story. And it's a burden because, and I say to you, what I've said to you is a lot. Do some self-care. Help a, a caregiver with their self-care. Invite them for a walk. Mm -hmm. Send them some flowers. Send them a gift card for a meal. Send them an Uber gift card. Do something. Show up. Now, I could say a lot more. Just remember that when a loved one is in crisis, it's not just the patient that's in crisis. Mm -hmm. It's the family that's in crisis. Their, yeah. their finances, their job. I, I have not worked full-time for anyone for seven years. Mm. I cannot because I do not know when crisis is going to happen. Relationships happen because you may not have spouses that can deal with it. People are leaving their families and not supporting their loved ones because they cannot handle mental health when their loved one is in crisis. And I'm talking about really, people are just walking away and leaving their loved ones. Show up for them. And if in a world where you can be anything, choose to be kind, mm -hmm. show up with compassion, mm -hmm. show up with love. We, our brain, I believe, is the most fragile organ in our body. Mm -hmm. We do not know what can happen to our lives one day to the next. We just went through a pandemic. Take care of your mind. Your brain is your mind. Your mind is your brain. Treat yourself with love. Treat others with love. Treat others with care and compassion. And give yourselves grace. Give yourselves grace, but learn. Educate yourselves. Educate yourselves about language, about what mental health and what mental illness is really about. And take the time for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having this conversation, Keddie. Thank you for having this conversation.